Well, hello again there, Mount Calvary friends. It's so great to be here and to share the word with you again. We're going to be going through 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 14 through 21. No, that's not a smudge on your cell phone screen. Uh, that is a mustache that I'm sporting. Isolation can do some wild things, and uh, that's what I've chosen to do. I hope you guys are doing well, though. We're I'm praying for you. I look forward to reconnecting when we see each other again. Um, but at this time, I'm just honored to be able to bring the word. And so take a moment, pause this, and read through 14 to 21. And a question that I want to start us with today is, what other believers do you look up to or do you try to imitate as you seek to grow in Christ? Who are those people who have been profoundly impactful on the growth of your, in the growth of your Christian life? walk. Think about those people, because it's been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And that's the main point of what Paul is calling the people to here in this text. He wants them to live differently, to imitate him as he seeks to imitate Christ. And so the calling of the Christian life, I would say, the big idea is not just to talk the talk of Christianity, to say the right words, but rather to actually walk in light of the gospel and what Christ has done and to seek to imitate him. And Paul begins this section in verse 14, saying, I don't want to shame you, but rather I want to warn or admonish you. His concern for the Corinthian church stems from those issues that, some of the issues that we've already looked at the last few chapters. The Corinthians were having a hard time putting off the old and putting on the new in their relationship with Christ. They were still thinking with the wisdom of the world and falling prey to factions and divisions and as we're going to see in the next couple of chapters, significant sin issues within the church. And so Paul is warning them. And how is he warning them? He says, I do it as a father warning a child. He calls them his beloved children, and he considers really himself their spiritual father. People had come to faith through the gospel ministry of Paul. The church was planted. A foundation was laid. We saw that in chapter 3. And so Paul's primary concern is seeing those believers flourish and grow in the faith and then be a faithful witness to the gospel. It's really, uh, this warning is coming from a place of a father wanting his child to grow to maturity and out of a deep love for them. Question for you, have, you, have your parents ever corrected you? I know for me that, that definitely was the case, and now as a parent, uh, we have started working on looking both ways before crossing the street. Huge milestone moments here. I've also found out how often I don't stop uh, when crossing the street based upon how my children are learning. And I don't correct them. I don't direct them in that way because I want to take charge and I want to show them my authority. But rather I do it out of a deep love for them. My correction is always because I have the best interests of my child and I want them to grow, whether in the faith or just in life skills, like being able to cross the street. And that's how Paul comes to the Corinthians. He's a, their spiritual father who's been integral in their growth and their coming to faith. And so he deeply cares for them and wants them to turn away from those things that they shouldn't be dealing with. He says, you have plenty of guides, but only one father. And then he gets to the crux of this text, really the first four chapters, I'd say, of verse 16. In light of all of this, imitate me. Now, that could sound conceited coming from most people. But with Paul, he's not necessarily saying that he's got it all together, that he's never failed. But yet he did continually exhibit Christ-likeness in his Christian walk, in the way he behaved. And he's saying instead of acting by the wisdom of the world, he wants them to imitate him imitate the way that he acted as we saw above in the first chap the first section of chapter 4 he wants them to be fine with being considered foolish for the sake of Christ to be humble and not boastful and proud and not thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to he wants them to recognize that all that they have all that they've been given whether skills gifts abilities salvation all of that is a gift from god and on their own they are not really actually extraordinary and so he wants them to take up the wisdom of the cross, the gospel, as Paul himself did, and live in light of it. And to enforce this point, Paul is going to be sending Timothy to encourage them and show them how to live. And so that same uh, urging is given to us as we seek to grow in Christ. 
not just to imitate Paul, but I would even say imitate those people who you thought about when I asked that opening question. Although imperfect, God oftentimes uses other believers in our life to grow us. My hope is that when we begin to recognize that our salvation, our justification, our sanctification, our final resurrection and glorification is all wrapped up in and found in the goodness of a gracious God who freely gave us Christ. There is no cause for boasting when the only thing we contributed to our salvation was our need for it. It should also cause us not to worry about our status among others because the one and only opinion that matters is the person who has already redeemed us. And so the focus should become how can we continue to grow in him and reflect him in our life. And this concern of Paul is also why he warns them at the end of this chapter, verses 18 to 21, that he's going to come if the Lord wills and asks, how do you want me to come? Do you want me to come with the rod of discipline or would you like me to come with love and gentleness and correction? In many ways, this section is the introduction to the next few chapters where Paul really gets into some significant and specific sin that is plaguing the Corinthian church. Yet at the same time, it's also a fitting conclusion to this section, making another distinction between the wisdom of the world, the arrogant in their talk, and the wisdom and power of God in the gospel. In Corinth, there were traveling rhetoricians that would come and speak about the issues of the day. They would be paid for their speaking engagements. Like many people, the Corinthians became attached to them and thought, Paul, you didn't have as much authority or you didn't speak as eloquently, but we like what these people have to say, and so we're going to go to the dynamic speaker. We're not interested in the person who brings the word in weakness, fear, and trembling. And yet Paul says the kingdom does not judge in that same way, it does not consist in talk, but in power. The difference being... Mere words and rhetorical ability, the ability to speak well, are passing, and in of themselves don't bring lasting change. Unlike the message of the cross, the gospel changes and shapes people's eternal destinies. And so, if the Lord wills, he's saying, how would you like me to come? Are you going to take care of the issues now so it can be a gentle and a restorative uh, visit, or are you going to continue to live as if you aren't in Christ, and I've got to come and bring some discipline? In a lot of ways, it's a very somber but clear end of this chapter, one in which Paul expresses great care and love for a people that he is connected to. And so for us today, the calling of the Christian life is not just to talk the talk of Christianity, but actually to walk in light of the gospel and to seek to imitate Christ. And so I'll follow up with a question that I began with. Who are those Christians in your life who have had a significant impact on your faith? And how might you be one of those people for someone else? And two, what is an area in your relationship with Christ where you might be struggling? Is it a place where you might need correction, perhaps a sinful attitude, an action, or a belief? My encouragement would be to turn to Christ. Maybe even that person that you seek to imitate and ask to be discipled so that our walk can continue to grow and to match our talk. I'm going to pray and then we can get going. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the words of Scripture, uh, that they are inspired, that they are inerrant, and we are so thankful uh, to be able to read them and to learn from them. And uh, I pray for this group, that you continue to strengthen them in the coming days and weeks, uh, that they would be turning away from the wisdom of the world and turning to the power of the cross, to the gospel, and resting solely in that and seeking to grow in the midst of it. Thank you for this day, Lord. We honor, we seek to honor you in all the things that we do and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.